2019 was a good year for Vince McMahon and the boys and girls of World Wrestling Entertainment. Laughing in the face of falling attendances and interest due in large part to their own creative lethargy, the Titan Sports juggernaut continued to rake it in thanks in part to numerous ludicrous TV deals. While we're all clearly chuffed that Kevin Dunn is getting those extra millions for continuing to induce motion sickness, the core of WWE's business should really be pay-per-view, or special events, or network specials. I'm not even sure what to call them anymore since the industry has changed so much in recent times and only a handful of people still order those shows through traditional methods. But I'm talking about those big shows that WWE television, in theory, should be building to. It's these shows that fans look forward to, or used to before the formula was reversed, so that now your pay-per-views build to your TV show or the next, even bigger extravaganza, which these days usually comes around two weeks later. With their minds on weekly televised output, the company clearly weren't trying last year as they presented some downright atrocious supercards. They weren't all duds, of course, and some shows managed to keep our attention and excite throughout. In between, there was no shortage of mediocre to sleep through. Looking back at the year, it was a truly bizarre one for many different reasons. Not taking into account NXT takeovers or those glorified house shows that WWE sometimes stick on their network, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic.com, and this is every WWE pay-per-view of 2019 ranked from worst to best. Join us. Number 14, Super Showdown. No prizes for guessing what comes in right smack at the bottom of our list. It's WWE Super Showdown, a show so bad that it's hard to know quite where to begin. I guess we'll start with the main event, an easy candidate for worst match of the year, possibly the decade. What would have been a dream match in years gone by quickly turned into a nightmare as Goldberg and The Undertaker had a howler that managed to sink below even the low expectations most had placed on it going in. There was considerable intrigue about two icons of the business going head to head for the first time ever in a major settings, but things fell apart almost immediately when Goldberg knocked himself loopy while colliding with the ring post. In a genuinely scary moment, the two made a hash of what I assume was supposed to be a jackhammer, but ended with the man planting the phenom right on his head with a brain buster that would make Kenta Kabashi blush. Outside of the tragic headliner, fans were treated to a 51-man battle royal, predictably won by Saudi superhero Mansoor Balboa, a long and dull Randy Orton versus his Triple H match, which I think is the 85th pay-per-view meeting between them, The Boss's son beating Roman Reigns, House Show Caliber Fair in the form of Baron Corbin versus Seth Rollins, Bobby Lashley versus Braun Strowman, and Kofi Kingston versus Dolph Ziggler, and the bungled pay-per-view debut of the already forgotten Lars Sullivan. Throw in a failed Money in the Bank cash-in from Lesnar, yes, they really did fly him all the way there for that, and you have a show that didn't offer a single great match, but did offer plenty of dodgy booking and heatless action. The closest thing to a good match was Andrade and Finn Balor's IC title bout. A planned match between Alexa Bliss and Natalya was rejected by the Saudi government. Number 13, Hell in a Cell. Hell in a Cell 2019 had a promising start but quickly went downhill on its way to falling off a cliff. The Raw Women's title Hell in a Cell match opener between Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks was a great way to start the show and the two had a long physical match with plenty of inventive spots that incorporated various weapons. Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns' tornado tag team match with Luke Harper and Eric Rowan was also fine and a perfectly decent way to spend 15 minutes. Ditto Randy Orton's match with the talented Mustafa Ali, and same again for the Kabuki Warriors Women's Tag Team Championship triumph over Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. Things took a dip in the next three matches, though. The Viking Raiders and Braun Strowman's clash with the OC was so undercooked it might as well have been Raw, or on Raw. Baron Corbin and Chad I can't believe we have to call him Shorty G Gable had another below-average match that spoke to the overall quality of their feud, and Bailey and Charlotte had a match that really, really should have been better when you think about what they're both capable of. So far, we've had some good matches, some average matches, and some not-so-good matches. Standard stuff. But Hell in a Cell really turns on its main event, pitting WWE Champion Seth Rollins against The Fiend in the eponymous Cell. As a match, it was nothing special. At least, I don't think it was. But then again, I couldn't really see a damn thing thanks to the combination of the red cell and that goddamn red lighting. I didn't even need to see the finish to know that it was crap, however, as the sound of the crowd vehemently turning on it and chanting AEW told me what I needed to know. Whoever booked a referee stoppage in a WWE title Hell in a Cell match, a pay-per-view main event, mind you, needs to have a serious word with themselves. An awful ending to a so-so show, the sheer audacity of WWE to pull that during the final moments sends this towards the bottom of our list. 
Number 12, Crown Jewel. Yes, we're back in Saudi Arabia for number 12, this time for Crown Jewel, which, considering it took place on Halloween, could have been even more frighteningly bad than its predecessor. Thankfully, the crew managed to put on a much better show this time around, and there are a couple of genuinely good matches to be found here. The biggest surprise of the night was Mansoor's match with Cesaro, a testament to the ability of the Swiss Superman as he made the hometown boy look like a million reels. Team Flair vs Team Hogan was a lot of fun once it got moving, as it should have been considering the talent on display. And the tag team turmoil match to determine the best tag team ever in the history of the universe, or something, was long but worth the investment. However, the show was not without its bad moments. The matches pitting Cain Velasquez against Brock Lesnar and Braun Strowman against Tyson Fury both had the potential to be interesting spectacles, but turned out pretty naff indeed, especially Kane vs Brock. And The Fiend's WWE title triumph over Seth Rollins was certainly newsworthy, but came at the end of a really bad match that was structured like a slasher film set on the streets of Amsterdam, thanks to the cartoonish hyperviolence being bathed in that distracting red light. One of the biggest stories of the night came not from the in-ring action, but the travel delays after the event, forcing many WWE wrestlers and staff to be stranded in the country and miss SmackDown the next day. The holdup was either due to a mechanical fault, or Vince and company being owed tens of millions of dollars for the shows, depending on who you believe. Anyway, here's to two more Saudi-based WWE pay-per-views a year, every year for the next million years. Number 11, TLC. Following the formula of the rotten Hell in a Cell we mentioned earlier was TLC, one more gimmick-laden supercard that was another of WWE's worst of the year. WWE's last pay-per-view of the year started off well enough, meandered in the middle, and then descended sharply into fast territory. It capped off a rather rotten year for WWE on pay-per-view, but there was still some good stuff to be found on the show. Once again, the opening match was the standout, as the dependable New Day and the Revival constructed a gutsy ladder match over the SmackDown tag team titles. Following that was a tough gig, but Buddy Murphy and Alistair Black gave it a good shot and beat the hell out of each other in a solid back and forth contest. And yeah, that's about it as far as genuine positives go, because the rest of the card was a steaming plate of low quality dog food. A perfect segue into the King Corbin Roman Reigns TLC match that was just about okay but went on forever and had a bad ending. Though not a total disaster, the match suffered because we've now seen these two clash on a million occasions and the feud was centered around Lane Joe and people getting covered in pedigree chum. Our pal The Fiend continued his shockingly booked run as WWE Champion in a non-title match with The Miz. Appearing without the mask, Bray was acting as the enthusiastic sweater-wearing presenter of the Firefly Funhouse. It was an intriguing twist and the match was smartly laid out, but it was also short and lacked the real intensity that the storyline had going into the match itself. And in the main event, the Kabuki Warriors beat Becky Lynch and Charlotte. Everyone tried and there were some good ideas, but it was a bit messy overall with missed spots and a distinct lack of story or psychology. That said, we need to be a little forgiving due to Kyrie Sane's reported concussion that meant the wrestlers had to improvise and change the match on the fly. Number 10, Stomping Grounds. And your newest entry into the lame WWE pay-per-view names Hall of Fame is Stomping Grounds, to be inducted alongside Great Balls of Fire, Capital Punishment, and The Bash. A generic name for a generic show, Stomping Grounds was something that nobody asked for but that we got, by God. Something else nobody asked for was a Seth Rollins versus Baron Corbin main event, with Lacey Evans as special referee, but we got one of those too! Corbin Rollins was not good, and served mainly to set up the lads teaming with Evans and Becky Lynch at the next big event, but we'll get to that in a bit. Other happenings include a good Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre match, another solid showing for the Scott. There was also a so-so Kofi Kingston versus Dolph Ziggler world title cage match. Who would have thought that these two would ever be having a big world title cage match on a pay-per-view? They've been fighting each other forever, and it's always been over secondary titles, but there you go. Ricochet and Samoa Joe had a good US title match, the result of which made Ricochet look like a star. Bailey and Alexa Bliss had a match for the SmackDown Women's title. If you'd have replaced the stomping ground set and ring design with that from any other show, you wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. And that's the thing about this and much of WWE's 2019 pay-per-view output, to be honest. Everyone is, to an extent, on autopilot, and the booking and match types are the same month in, month out. I could tell you about the New Day against Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, Heavy Machinery against Eric Rowan and Daniel Bryan, or Becky Lynch against Lacey Evans, but really, is there any need to go out of your way to see them? Unfortunately, there really isn't, and as such, there's no reason to seek out stomping grounds. 
Number nine, fast lane. Number nine is fast lane, and that means we're on the road to WrestleMania, a road that necessitates several arbitrary stops where typically nothing of consequence happens. And that was the case with fast lane, a truly pointless addition to WWE's events calendar, but one that at least produced mostly good wrestling, if not a great deal of thrilling storyline development. The revival's defense of the Raw tag team titles over the teams of Alistair Black and Ricochet and Chad Gable and Bobby Roode was match of the night and showed the genius behind putting six talented guys in the ring together with few restrictions and telling them to have a good one. Also fun was the US title four-way between Samoa Joe, R-Truth, Andrade and Rey Mysterio. A bonus match, this was also another breezy 10 minutes full of fast-paced action and a lovely addition to the card. Daniel Bryan's defense of the WWE title over Kevin Owens and Mustafa Ali was also really bloody good, but again there was never any doubt as to the winner here. And in the main event, The Shield teaming up for the last time ever, apart from that other last time ever a month later, down the terrible trio of Bobby Lashley, Baron Corbin, and Drew McIntyre. A good match, but not unlike a million other Shield six-man matches out there. Elsewhere, Shane McMahon and The Miz set the stage for their WrestleMania outing, Asuka quickly dispatched Mandy Rose, Kofi Kingston continued to get pasted as a warm-up for the biggest match of his life, and Becky Lynch and Charlotte had a scrap to set up a date with Ronda Rousey. A good show with some really entertaining entertaining matches, you can nevertheless feel free to skip this one and your pathetic little life will carry on as normal. Number 8. Clash of Champions What happened to the THE? Why isn't it Clash of THE Champions? Like that old WCW show that people used to like. Doesn't it sound better? Clash of THE Champions? Clash of Champions? I don't know. Anyway, this was another pretty bog standard show with a few good matches, a little bit of storyline advancement, and a whole load of stuff that wouldn't look out of place on an episode of Raw or SmackDown. First, the good. Kofi Kingston and Randy Orton entered another chapter into their storied rivalry with a solid match for the WWE title. Seth Rollins versus Braun Strowman was good while it lasted, even if some considered it marred by Strowman choking yet again and failing to win the Universal title. Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks was another good match with a flat finish, and most fans love the Miz and Shinsuke Nakamura's IC title effort, even if, as a match, it didn't set the world on fire. Main event foes Strowman and Rollins teamed up in the opener to lose the Raw Tag Team titles to possibly the most boring tag team of all time, Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler. Bayley and Charlotte's SmackDown women's title match was a huge disappointment and felt more like a TV angle than a big pay-per-view match. New Day vs The Revival and Eric Rowan vs Roman Reigns were both fine. This whole show was fine actually, but I can certainly think of better and more productive ways to spend three hours. Number seven, Elimination Chamber. The thing about Elimination Chamber is that, even if the rest of the card is rotten, at least the titular match or matches will be good. That was essentially the case here, as an otherwise weak show was bookended by two stellar bouts taking place inside the steel structure. The first of these was to crown the inaugural women's tag team champions and saw six teams fighting it out for the honor. With so many moving parts and potentially 12 bodies in there at one time, this had the potential to get messy. Thankfully, it was a smash hit as everyone involved worked incredibly hard and took a hell of a beating to make the match one to remember. Likewise, the six men competing for the WWE title in the main event brought their A-game and went hell for leather to entertain. As well as being a breathtaking display of great wrestling and dangerous stunts, the match also had a gripping story running throughout. The last 10 minutes between Daniel Bryan and Kofi Kingston produced some of the best drama seen in a WWE ring all year. The crowd desperately wanted Kofi to win and punch his ticket for WrestleMania and bought into every near fall. Bryan's eventual win was a down but in hindsight and considering what was to come at WrestleMania, it was just another part of Kofi's incredible journey. Elsewhere, Ronda Rousey beat Ruby Riot in seconds, Baron Corbin beat Braun Strowman in a match that I wish had lasted seconds, Finn Balor won the IC title in a handicap match with Bobby Lashley and Leo Rush, and the Usos won the tag team titles from Shane and The Miz. But you know what? Skip all of that and go out of your way for the chamber matches. Number 6. Money in the Bank The sixth best WWE pay-per-view of 2019 Money in the Bank just edges Elimination Chamber because it had one extra stellar bout, despite being similarly opened and closed by two strong gimmick matches. The Money in the Bank concept is, 15 years after it was first introduced, rather played out, but the matches themselves are usually nothing if not thrilling, and there was no shortage of thrills and spills here. The women again set the tone with an action-packed match where Naomi and Ember Moon seemed determined to steal the show or die trying. Everyone played their part here, and the show got off on the right foot. Then things 
things faltered. Rey Mysterio and Samoa Joe should be able to conjure up a classic, but this was another effort from them that went awry, ending in a minute after Joe sustained an injury and the referee counting the pin despite the Samoan submission machine's shoulders being about three feet off the mat. Kofi Kingston's WWE title defense over Kevin Owens was another decent showing from Kofi, even though he was never able to have a true barn burner during his title reign. Much better was AJ Styles and Seth Rollins' Universal title match, which shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who has watched these fellas work over the past few years. And the men's Money in the Bank match was a great spectacle that maybe even featured a few too many dangerous stunts for my liking. Look, if my mum didn't let me go out on my bike without a helmet on, I don't see why these lads should be powerbombing each other through ladders. Just saying. Number 5. WrestleMania 35 The granddaddy of them all may not have had a plethora of classic matches to choose from, but it had enough good ones and genuine WrestleMania moments to help it crack the top 5. The undisputed highlight of the show was Kofi Mania running wild, as the Prince of Pancakes finally overcame Daniel Bryan to win the WWE title. A great wrestling match with the right result, this proved that WWE still know how to pull the trigger on someone and create an amazing moment when they can be asked. Asked is what I'm assuming Brock Lesnar wasn't when the creative called for him to lose his Universal title to Seth Rollins in just a few minutes to open the show. A great way to start the main portion of the card, this was unexpected but brilliant. Other bright spots on the undercard were Randy Orton and AJ Styles having a dependably good match, a fun four-way for the SmackDown Tag Team titles, and Roman Reigns squaring off with Drew McIntyre. Two retirements also took place at WrestleMania 35, with Batista having one last epic with Triple H in a nice bit of symmetry for Big Dave, even if it did go on a little bit too long, and Kurt Angle bowing out in a match with Baron Corbin. It has been well documented that Angle physically hadn't been capable of giving a performance the standard of even a few years ago going into this one, but a short match with an old rival like a John Cena or a Shelton Benjamin would have been nice instead. And the main event between Lynch, Flair and Rousey would have probably been more effective as a straight singles match between the man and Rowdy Ronda, but as it was, forgiving the dodgy finish, it was a good way to end the show, the first time women have headlined the event. The rest of the card and the pre-show are a mixed bag, and at a legitimate seven and a half hours, it's a tall ask for one sitting. However, there's definitely enough good stuff here to make WrestleMania 35 worth your while. Number 4. Extreme Rules They say WWE is usually better when they have actual competition. That that hasn't been the case for some time now, but with the advent of AEW, hopefully that leads to a creative renaissance from a company that has been in dire need of new ideas for some time. The competition of AEW's Fight for the Fallen pay-per-view, which took place the night before, clearly emboldened WWE superstars to give a little extra at Extreme Rules and helped contribute to one of the surprise shows of the year. Perhaps there was no bigger surprise than the Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans versus Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch main event being actually, well, pretty good considering. Brock Lesnar scored another easy payday after the match, handily beating up Rollins before winning the Universal title. I hope Brock was paid $50,000 for every suplex. Of the matches with an extreme theme, The Undertaker and Roman Reigns, the biggest, baddest dogs in the yard, had a really decent no-holds-barred match with Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre. And Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley under last man standing rules was reasonable and had its bright spots. The rest of the matches were contested under standard rules and ranged in quality, but were mostly worth watching. Cesaro and Alistair Black was as snug and energetic as you would want it to be, the Revival and the Usos could have a good tag team match in their sleep, Ricochet and AJ Styles, while disappointing at SummerSlam, was fantastic here, and Kofi Kingston vs Samoa Joe was yet another solid title defense for Kofi. Oh, and Dolph Ziggler got murked by Kevin Owens, blasted with a stunner, and pinned in seconds, which is seven stars on the Pachiti star system. Number 3. SummerSlam Another of WWE's original big for SummerSlam has managed to retain its aura in an era of constant content and increasingly frequent super shows. SummerSlam 2019 was another in a series of great shows full of mostly good wrestling and little nonsense. The pace was set with Becky Lynch and Natalya, who had a match full of non-stop action over the Raw women's title. The Bill Goldberg Redemption Tour rolled into town and rolled over Dolph Ziggler, not once, not twice, but three times, earning to man a lot of goodwill after the horror show with The Undertaker. AJ Styles vs. Ricochet and Bailey vs. Ember Moon weren't as good as expected, but pleasantly, Shane McMahon vs. Kevin Owens was better than it could have been thanks to a hot crowd and some smoke and mirrors. Not literally, of course, that would be silly. Also on the SmackDown side, Orton and Kofi continued their rivalry with a slow, methodical match with a terrible double count-out finish. Trish Stratus got another shot at her career's 
storybook ending, coming out of retirement for a match with her modern-day avatar, Charlotte Flair. Showing no signs of ring rust and hanging with one of the best currently doing it, Trish gave her everything to help put on a match she can be proud to call her last. One character making his debut was The Fiend, the mysterious alter ego of Bray Wyatt. Everyone was curious what we were going to get from The Fiend and he certainly gave us something to talk about, with a memorable entrance and a squash victory over Finn Balor. It wasn't for everyone, but at least it was something different and made The Fiend instantly intriguing. Fittingly, the last match of the night was also the best, Seth Rollins and Brock Lesnar combining to produce a train wreck in the best sense of the term. Brock proved why he's one of the very best ever with this performance, and Becky Lynch's fiance brought the fire as well, because he wanted to burn it down, because, because that's his whole thing, isn't it? Number 2. Royal Rumble The 2019 Royal Rumble was ladies' night, and no, that doesn't mean they got two-for-one Smirnoff Ices and free entry into the wet t-shirt competition, but that it was WWE's female contingent that really stole the show at one of the most anticipated events of the year. Becky Lynch, so often depended upon to kick off WWE pay-per-views in style, did so again in a rousing SmackDown women's title match with Asuka. Lynch lost, but that wouldn't be the last time we saw her on the night. Another great match was for the Raw women's title, a submission based affair between Sasha Banks and Ronda Rousey. The two managed to create some real genuine drama despite the result never really being in question. The Women's Royal Rumble didn't have the surprises that the 2018 version had, unless you count Hornswoggle, which I don't, but it did have a lot of action and really got going by the end. Highlights included Kyrie Sane getting an opportunity to shine, the yearly Naomi Elimination Escape Act, and Charlotte getting to look like a killer. Surprise entrant Becky Lynch was a popular winner. On the men's side of things, Finn Balor and Brock Lesnar had a good match for the Universal title. Brock always seems to try hard when he's in there with smaller guys, and this was a fun and fast 10 minuter. Not as fun or fast, but still pretty decent, was AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan's WWE title match. More methodical in pace, this was a strong style effort that had more more deliberate psychology to it as well as some big bumps. And the bar dropped the tag straps to The Miz and Shane McMahon in a match memorable for Shane dusting off the old shooting star press for the win. As for the men's Royal Rumble match, it was another solid effort with multiple threads running through it and some moments that WWE can replay on highlight reels for years to come, like Nia Jax stealing R-Truth's number 30 spot and eliminating poor Mustafa Ali before taking a super kick, RKO and 619. Lovely stuff. In the end, Seth Rollins burned it down, oh he bloody loves burning it down, won the match and began weeks of star pointing on his way to the Wrestlemania main event. Well, the Wrestlemania opener, but still, well done Seth. Number 1. Survivor Series WWE decided to freshen things up with Survivor Series 2019, adding NXT into the mix and making a tri-branded battle for supremacy. The inclusion of stars from WWE's third brand created an air of unpredictability and resulted in some match combinations that fans would have not otherwise seen. Kicking off the main show was a task once again given to the talented women of the three brands. With three teams of five women, this was always going to be a marathon, not a sprint, and the ladies put on a phenomenal 30-minute match, capped off with a star-making performance from eventual survivor Rhea Ripley. NXT continued their role as Roderick Strong bested AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura in the next match, a predictably stiff one that again was all action. The following contest was an all-NXT affair, with Pete Dunne and Adam Cole fighting fighting it out over the NXT title. This was another winner with a lot of great exchanges and a great story told throughout, with both men doing a grand job of selling the beating from war games at TakeOver the night before. The Fiend's title triumph over Daniel Bryan was really decent, but did feel like it had the potential to go into another gear before it ended. The men of Raw, SmackDown and NXT collided in a smartly booked and expertly executed match that once again made a star out of an NXT competitor. This time it was Keith Lee who came out looking like gold, lasting until the end and threatening to best WWE Golden Boy Roman Reigns in a nail-biting finishing sequence before succumbing to the big dog. Rey Mysterio and Brock Lesnar's title match could have been longer in different circumstances, i.e. a show that's less than five hours long if you include the pre-show, but it was really great while it lasted, and we got to see Rey dress like a funny little clown, hitting a double 619 with his son. And then Brock Lesnar murdered them both.